This video is brought to you by Squarespace from websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Doing that online right now seems pretty smart. Two simple things. Maybe you've got some idea for a website or a business or a YouTube channel or a podcast. It's knocking around in your head. You think, this is the best thing ever. Well, two, the only way to figure out if that is the best thing ever is to make a website on Squarespace and get it out into the world. And I know that can be scary because it's a new thing and maybe people will hate it. And you know, maybe they will, but you won't know unless you get it out there. Get it on a website with Squarespace. They allow you to create a powerful website for whatever you're up to. Want to sell something? Sure. Want to do a podcast? Absolutely. Want to do a YouTube channel? Well, you know, this is YouTube, put the videos here, but you'll want a companion website. It all starts on Squarespace with a beautiful template that you can customize to your heart's content or start from scratch if you think you're good at design. I'm not. I would never do that. Just use a template. <laughs> and once you've gone through the easy customization process, there are no updates. There are no patches. There's no tech bull to deal with. And Squarespace also handles all of that websitey stuff. Podcasts, like I said, mailing lists, social integrations, it's all there and they got 24 seven support for when you get confused. Hopefully you won't because it's fairly easy to use, but you know, just in case you do, I would get confused. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash brain food. You get 10% off a website or a domain. And let's get into it. If you're like most people, you probably assume when you flush the toilet that the sanitation wizard simply cast the scourgeify charm as your expulsions exit the main pipe coming out of your house, thereby eliminating it with little effort or expense. That's what most people would assume? All right. <laughs> While that would be an easy solution, it turns out, for historic reasons, a different, much more complicated system was put in place to make sure that your home isn't constantly backed up with sewage and that the hundreds of billions of gallons of wastewater we produce daily can be reasonably safely put back into general circulation on our little spacecraft named Earth. Also, you know, because there were no wizards. So, how does this wonder of modern technology work? First, a quick caveat that the exact mechanisms can vary from public sewer system to sewer system, and of course, in more rural areas, many use septic systems, which we'll get into in a bit. But in the general case, when talking mass systems, once your excretions exit your front and rear valves into the canine water bowl that is your toilet, and then they are flushed down, all of this goes into the pipes in your home where it ultimately joins with other wastewater. Eventually, this is all trapped when it encounters the princess of friendship, twilight sparkle in her friends that your daughter has also flushed. When this happens, you call a plumber who will do his or her thing to ensure Twilight, Pinkie Pie, and Rarity never see Equestria again as they are expunged from the pipes of your domicile and out into larger unground pipes. Once out, this all in turn mixes with your neighbor's expulsions, wastewater, and their kids' toys, meaning there's always potential that you and your neighbor's poop sometimes touches, which is very weird to think about. Once in the wider city. <laughs> Once in the. <laughs> <laughs> Morning, John! Our poo's touched. <laughs> Once in the wider system, this slurry may also potentially be mixed in with water from rain and the likes that goes down storm drains. From there, it enters even larger pipes on its way towards a wastewater treatment plant with many connections along the way. For a reference of scale here, the city of Boston is estimated to have just under 60,000 miles that's 100,000 kilometers for metric people of sewer pipes that all feed into their wastewater treatment plants. Noteworthy here is that the piping systems have to be carefully designed to account for elevation changes and the like to minimize the chances of clogging at pivotal low elevation points. Should they not, one who has their home at a lower elevation than most could well see their toilets and sinks absolutely exploding with My Little Ponies and John's Poo. On this note, some systems do require pumping stations at certain low points, but regardless, the wastewater treatment plants are usually put at lower elevations than the region they are serving. Of course, clogs along the way from home to wastewater processing plant can and do happen, given random debris can get into the systems via storm drains and the like, or maybe John just taking a massive stinker of a 
Even though that was a joke, adults do flush a lot of weird stuff down the toilet that they probably shouldn't. On that note, if you're flushing literally anything but toilet paper or your expulsions down the toilet, your wastewater treatment plant operators think you're kind of worse than the douche that you flushed. This includes flushing so-called flushable wet wipes, which are technically flushable, but, well, so is a cat. Doesn't mean you should wipe your butt with one and then flush it. Put it in the trash afterwards. Don't be a savage. Or as Deputy Commissioner for the Bureau of Wastewater Treatment in New York, Pam Elardo states, even if it says flushable on the box, if it's not toilet paper, it should not be flushed. So what happens is all these baby wipes and facial wipes and Clorox bleach wipes and whatever makeup stuff that people flush, tampons, condoms, and everything, it comes to the plants. We have to screen out that debris before we put it into the treatment plant. We do our best to screen it out, and we spend over $7 million a year hauling off stuff that gets stuck on our screen. Even with these screens, a lot of those rags and baby wipes and facial stuff gets through the screen and ends up clogging pipes. When it clogs pipes, it's really bad. You've got raw sewage that can't flow, and you have to have people in there getting inside the pumping mechanism to retrieve the wipes and all that garbage people throw in there. If I didn't have the staff or the expertise or the people that stay on top of it, we'd be backing up sewage into people's homes all the time or overflowing sewage into the receiving water, so it's something that we constantly have to put up with. And suddenly I'm extremely grateful for my job where I just get to sit here and read scripts to you. And just as an idea of the volume of water that they deal with, she notes New York City wastewater treatment plants process anywhere from 1.3 to 3 billion gallons of wastewater per day. So, you know, like I say, don't be a savage. In any case, once the sewage gets to its ultimate destination of the wastewater processing plant, as Commissioner Elardo alluded to, the first thing that needs to be done is to screen off tampons, wet wipes, condoms, diapers, pennywise, sticks, etc. Anything that can't properly be broken down. Oh, that would have been a better way to get rid of pennywise, wouldn't it? <laughs> it's like, oh no, he's back. I'll just flush him down the toilet. Anything that can't probably be broken down or would clog the main system. This is accomplished by a series of screens with these points periodically then being cleaned out, whether via automated scrapers or in smaller facilities, sometimes just done manually. Mm -hmm. The trapped objects are then taken to their final destination of landfills or incinerators or children's nightmares. For a reference here, the city of Tampa, Florida notes on their page trying to get people to stop flushing anything but toilet paper and human expulsions down the toilet that they transport about 5,000 cubic yards or about 350 to 400 dump truck loads per year of such screened off garbage that should not have been flushed. Or to sum it all up, basically the workers are really tired of dealing with your crap and really just want to have to deal with your shit. As you might guess from this, much like many other systems we depend on for our daily lives, should workers at these plants stop working even for just a day or two, society would go to crap fairly quickly. So take the time to thank a sanitation worker today. Thank you, sanitation workers. After this, I'm going to take a big sh In any event, after the initial screening, the remaining solid and liquid matter will usually enter something you can more or less think of as a really large garbage disposal. The purpose of this is to grind and stir everything remaining sufficiently so that what you have left is a nice deep brown sludgy liquid similar to hot chocolate, but you know, absolutely nothing like that and if you drink it you're probably gonna die a horrible death. Now at this point, there will still be some solids that can't easily be broken down, and so the next step is for this mixture to go into a grit chamber where solids like sand, rocks, wedding rings, your hopes and dreams, and the like are allowed to sink to the bottom and will once again be removed regularly and transported to a landfill. Important to note here is that because things need to be slowed down at this point, there are often large basins to potentially hold excess influx of wastewater if the system itself can't keep up with what is coming in at a given moment, which particularly may be the case during abnormally heavy rainfall or if there is a clog that develops in the processing system. In the next stage, any remaining solids, usually organic in nature at this point, are allowed to settle to the bottom or for faster removal, some use pressurized air to inject bubbles into the slurry. This has the dual benefit of first causing much of the remaining solids to float to the surface where they can be quickly skimmed off, and second, it helps to promote the growth of the microbes that at this stage are responsible 
responsible for breaking down things in the slurry. We got really far away from hot chocolate. <laughs> the skimmed off solids are often then transported to a thickener system and then to a digester area where various microbes and enzymes are used to break down the sludge. Later, once sufficiently processed, this matter will be transported to an area where it will be dried out and used for things like fertilizer. Noteworthy here is the gases given off in these steps are also sometimes harvested for biofuel production, sometimes even used to generate power to run the plant itself or more. As noted by the aforementioned New York Commissioner Pam Alado, we don't necessarily use all our gas and we're getting this extra gas. National Grid came along. We created a program where they're going to build a scrubber, which is basically a method to clean the gas and strip out the water and other impurities from the gas. Then they're going to put that gas directly into their regional pipeline, which will then go to people's homes so they can cook their dinner and then use their toilets and then put the waste in our system. Then we'll create more gas from that. It's the circle of life. Going back to the remaining liquids, after most of the solids are removed at this stage, as ever what happens varies a bit in specifics from system to system, but at a high level, the liquid is generally placed somewhere where microbes continue the processing. In the simplest form of processing, this may even be in a special pond or lagoon, which may be seeded with things like certain planktonic life, like Daphnia, to help the microbes process things. And that sounds like the most horrible pond ever. In higher throughput systems, however, things tend to need to happen a lot faster. So in these cases, other methods are used to speed the process up. For example, aluminium chloride is often used to remove excess phosphorus, certain bacteria are used to process nitrogen, etc. On that note, once everything is sufficiently processed by our single-celled friends, the water is good enough to drink. Not really. Instead, they are given one of the most important of life lessons when the water and microbes are transported to a tank or system designed to kill said microbes once they are no longer useful to society. This may come in the form of killing them with UV light, chlorinating the water, ozonation, etc. Speaking of ozonation, while relatively expensive compared to other methods of sanitizing, this also has a huge benefit of being shown to break down many pharmaceuticals and other chemicals that find their way into drains and the like, which is an ever-increasing problem. We're all on drugs. After all of this processing, it's also quite common for one last filtration system to be used, running the liquid through activated carbon and sand filters, similar to many water purifiers that you might use at home. Finally, the surprisingly clean water is released back into the environment via rivers, into the ocean, and sometimes even piped into another system to be used for things like irrigation water in particularly dry regions. For example, approximately half of all agricultural water in Israel comes from its wastewater plants. As for septic systems, these are essentially just miniaturized versions of all of this. While there are a variety of design possibilities, in general the wastewater and solids go into a tank where it may be ground up and pumped into a secondary tank, or may simply just stay in the first tank. Whatever the exact design, the solids ultimately mostly settle to the bottom and the liquids are pumped or gravity fed off to pipes where the wastewater is released back into the ground. At that point, soil and microbes finish the cleaning process. As for the solids that sit in the tank, the organic variety are slowly broken down over time with the microbes in your gut generally providing what's needed to make that happen. Of course, over time, they may still build up sufficiently to need some want to come and pump out the tank. But in a well-designed system where people are only putting toilet paper, wastewater, and human expulsions in, this may take years before a pumping is needed. So, I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, you know what to do. Smash that like button, subscribe. Support this channel by supporting the amazing people at Squarespace and their amazing tool for building websites. Link below. Thanks for watching.